Okay. Well, um, let's start with um, in this last day for summer school, and we hope you are all there <laughs> still with us. Uh, now I have the pleasure to introduce um, the third plenary devoted to digital data and digital methods for research in linguistics. And I am truly glad and honored uh, to welcome and present Professor Susan C. Herring. <laughs> Susan Herring. <laughs> um, she's Professor of Information Science and Linguistics and Director of uh, the Center for Computer Mediated Communication at Indiana University Bloomington. Trained in linguistics at the University of California at Berkeley, she was among the first scholars to apply linguistic methods to analysis to, of analysis uh, to CMC, initially with a focus on uh, gender issues. Then she consolidated those methods into the computer mediated discourse analysis approach that I myself apply in my own research, I must say, which has been used in her case to analyze structural, programmatic, interactional, and social phenomena in digital communication. Her recent interests include multilingual and graphic or multimodal CMC. She has been the editor of the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication, and it, at present, she edits Language at Internet. Uh, these are online journals of reference for anyone interested in doing research on digital discourse. She has published widely on language and interaction in any digital platform or device you may know since 1992. Uh, uh, the list of her publication is uh, astounding, amazing. Uh, it's available online if you go to the, her uh, personal uh, website. So you, you see all the publications and uh, most of them are available online and it's this is great, I think. Um, and uh, she has, uh, as I say, published many, many chapters, book chapters, edited books, uh, papers, etc. And I'll mention only the more recent one. Um, prompt reach CMC on YouTube. To what or to whom do comments respond? Uh, Mio, okay, I shouldn't have done that. Factors influencing vocal performance through an emoji. Miscommunication through stickers in online group discussions, a multiple case study. Sticker and emoji used in Facebook Messenger implications for graphicon change. Uh, grammar and electronic communication and uh, the edited book, Language and Discourse of Social Media. But these are very, very few examples of her, very few titles of her publications. And I invite you to go to her website uh, to see what she has published so far. Well, uh, I stop here and I give uh, the floor to Susan, uh, but just let me thank you again, Susan, for uh, being here and for sharing with us your work and your ideas. Thank you again. Oh, you're, it's my pleasure and uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm going to share my screen now because I have prepared a few slides. And that's an understatement because it, for a two hour presentation, I don't think I've ever had so many slides before. It's very nice to be spending this time with you. Um, you're mostly in, in a morning time. It's 11 o'clock at night for me here in California. And by the time I finish, it will be 1 p.m. So, uh, if I fall asleep during my talk, please wake me up. Um, let me give a little bit more background of uh, my, my story, my evolution professionally, so that it may make more sense how I ended up where I am now doing the kinds of work that I'm doing. Because I started off doing something very different. I was uh, a field linguist studying uh, Tamil, a Dravidian language spoken in the south of India. And I spent several years in India doing research on uh, tense and aspect in oral narrative discourse. And that was the topic of my dissertation at Berkeley. Uh, but when I got back to Berkeley after my time in India, um, 
a lot was going on with this new phenomenon of internet communication. Uh, as part of the early internet backbone it, in Berkeley, we had access to private email and something called Unix Talk, Unix Talk which was a real-time uh, line-by-line command thing where you could send brief messages to somebody else on a Unix system. And what really got me started, though, was that in 1990, the linguist list started up. And uh, some of you may be well familiar with this. You may not know, though, that way back then, it was uh, in more of a discussion format than it is now. Uh, and so there were lots of interesting discussions that took place. And all the members of the Linguistic Society of America were automatically subscribed in fall of 1990. But by early 1991, conflict had broken out, a flame war uh, between Chomskyan linguists and uh, non-Chomskyan linguists, let's put it that way, over the uh, ownership of the term cognitive linguistics. And when I observed this taking place, coming to my screen, because it was a push technology, I would just get emails from the group uh, on a regular basis. Um, I was fascinated by the gender dynamics uh, in online communication. And so, although I had never studied gender before, I, in fact, never studied English before, I'd always looked at other languages, I started researching uh, gender patterns of communication uh, in online discussion forums. Uh, but then I was teaching at the time in a linguistics department. I was hired as a field linguist. Uh, and so through the 90s, I call this my schizophrenic period because on the one hand, I was teaching about and uh, had done research on historical Dravidian linguistics, especially discourse grammar. Uh, but then I was very interested in this new field of computer mediated communication. And what happened then was that I was hired away to Indiana University in uh, information science of all things that I had never studied or knew anything about uh, so that I could focus on my CMC work. And that's what I've done. This is a picture of me when I first joined Indiana University in 2000. And during that time, I developed a paradigm called computer mediated discourse analysis, which I'll be talking about today. Um, the, this talk is organized according to the following roadmap. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about CMC as data for language study, uh, then a little about the history of linguistic studies of CMC up to the present day. Then I will introduce the CMDA research paradigm and give an example or several examples of different interesting phenomena that CMDA uh, have revealed. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about a few methodological considerations involving data sampling, coding, and reliability assessment from the CMDA perspective, and uh, finish up with some words about multimodality, which is really the future or the present, I should say, of computer-mediated discourse. Uh, and then I'll conclude by summarizing some of the main takeaways. Uh, a couple of preliminaries first. First, some caveats. Uh, unlike the title of my talk, I won't be talking about all kinds of digital data, uh, just mainly interactive computer-mediated communication, and not all possible linguistic methods that one could use to study uh, digital data. As I said, I'll be focusing on uh, computer-mediated discourse analysis methods, discourse analysis methods, more generally. Also, the studies that I'm citing are mostly in English, and this is just because this is what I'm um, most familiar with, although I've done some other work in other languages. And I apologize in advance for citing myself. Um, I've been very active in developing the CMDA paradigm, and so uh, a lot of the work is my own. Um, but I do always feel embarrassed about citing myself a lot. So. Uh, it violates the pragmatic norm of, uh, of uh, self-praise. You know, we shouldn't do this, but I'm not intending to praise myself when I cite my work, but simply to uh, provide the references for what I'm talking about. A couple words about logistics. Two hours is a, a very long time to talk in my experience, but it's also a very long time for you to listen. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about different topics um, that are not necessarily related to each other. And so I recommend that if you have questions or comments that you write them down as I'm going along or post them in the chat when you think of them, because you may not remember by the end. Uh, I may not see them until the end. 
Um, but you should feel free to post questions or comments at any time. Also, uh, if you need to take a break, you know, please feel free to do so. I'm going to soldier on as best I can, uh, unless I need to take a break. So we're gonna start with computer mediated communication. Uh, and I define it as human-human communication by means of messages transmitted via networked or wireless computers. The computers may be stationary or mobile, and so smartphones count as computers for this purpose. And the messages may be communicated by text, by speech, by graphics, by moving images, and other things like smart speakers. And although there has been a very strong trend towards multimodality, which I'll talk about at the end of my talk, most popular CMC still remains primarily textual. So text is not uh, obsolete at all, um, despite predictions that were made back in the 1990s. I remember in the mid 90s, when I was studying this and people were saying, oh, but everything's becoming multimodal now. Um, what are you going to study when there's no, lo no longer any text? And I said, I think there's always going to be text. Well, and so far anyway, I've been right. Email, uh, text chat, live chat, instant messaging, text messaging, blogs, wikis, and for that matter, social network sites are all primarily text-based. And so I'm going to be focusing primarily on text in my talk today. Um, I'm gonna to start though with an anecdote. In 1999, I was giving a talk at an international conference um, in an invited session where the organizer of the session had a theory and he had invited different scholars to engage with his theory. And so his theory wasn't working very well for my data, which were historical data from uh, academic discussion forums. But he became quite unhappy about this. And when I came to my time to end and I still hadn't quite finished, he cut me off abruptly. And then he proceeded to say that uh, what I was talking about was, was no good because CMC was not real language it, because it was written and writing is not real language for the purpose of linguists, uh, linguistics. Um, now, CMC is in fact, neither uh, speech of course, uh, nor uh, traditional writing. It's generally been characterized as a hybrid uh, so we have expressions like written speech or speech written down, um, a new hybrid register, Taliamanti and Denis, where hybrid is between speaking and writing. Uh, uh, Chiruti and Onesti uh, say that it's a blend of both formal and informal uh, language use. And then we have these more discourse oriented characterizations like interactive written discourse and visible conversation. And so, uh, CMC is not simply uh, writing. Uh, moreover, it's authentic in the sense that it is used widely by, by many people of all ages, especially young people, uh, as a important means of communication. So I, I disagree with my colleague who said that CMC is not a uh, real language. Um, as data for linguistic analysis, CMC in fact has a number of advantages. Textual CMC is pre-transcribed. And so if you've worked with spoken languages, you know how time consuming it can be to transcribe. Uh, but we have here online tons of data that's already uh, available uh, because it was typed in. Um, the observer's paradox where the presence of the linguist can change the nature of what people say uh, is not relevant because in most um, environments in, in forums or chat rooms or whatever, um, you can be visible, sort of, if anybody wants to bother looking, but your presence probably doesn't go no isn't noticed. And so the interaction that takes place is, is naturally occurring. And also it's a wonderful way to study language change in progress because we have data continuously now going back uh, into about 1980 or 1981. Uh, and so it's a, um, a great data set for studying change, language change. Now there are some limitations. Of course, uh, written textual CMC, especially if it's asynchronous, is more edited and therefore less spontaneous than speech. And so it may not represent all the most spontaneous uh, kinds of language use. Um, and also if you're doing variationist sociolinguistic studies, there uh, it's difficult to be 
certain about the uh, information about the participants, their demographics, for example, although we have some ways of working around that. Uh, so I want to now introduce computer mediated discourse as a concept that's related to but distinct from CMC. Computer mediated discourse or CMD is the discourse produced using CMC technologies. And it's really, it's a perspective that is differentiated from CMC because it focuses on language and language use. It is the language and language use uh, in CMC. But you'll find that in, in this talk and also in the literature that people will often use CMC as the more general term, even when they're doing language focused research where uh, computer mediated discourse is what they're really talking about. And so here too, I'll use the term somewhat interchangeably, uh, except when I'm referring specifically to the technology, which would then be CMC or the discourse, which is CMD. And uh, now CMC is part of a much broader phenomenon than what I'm gonna be talking about today. And as an area of study, it's inherently interdisciplinary. And so here uh, is kind of some indication of all the different fields that uh, have some interest in CMC, uh, applied fields, as well as more theoretical ones. And of course, the field of communication is a primary contributor to research about CMC. Uh, CMD, we can see, is being a part of CMD, which is studied mainly by linguists, but also some communication scholars uh, study uh, computer-mediated discourse as well. Now, it's important when studying CMC to understand its nature. And one way that we do that is through classification. Uh, when I teach about this, I teach two uh, approaches to classification. One is socio-technical modes, the other is faceted classification. What do I mean by these? Socio-technical modes are genres of CMC that combine messaging protocols, the technology, and the social and cultural practices that have evolved around the use of the technical protocols. And so we have things like email, internet relay chat, instant messaging, web forums, blogs, wiki, social network sites. These are all examples of socio-technical modes. Um, faceted classification is uh, an approach that comes out of, actually out of library science. Uh, it's based on a set of features or facets and values or terms for each feature that can be used to classify any given instance of computer-mediated discourse. Uh, and the idea comes from work by Runganathan in 1933, uh, where he talked about this as an analytical synthetic process. It's analytical in the sense that you break down your, your data sample, whatever it might be, according to all the different facets, and then you synthesize them into a kind of a global um, definition or characterization. Uh, and in faceted classification for CMD, there are two main dimensions. The medium variables, which refer to the system, to the technology, and situation variables, which refer to the context uh, and social factors. And so this is what the medium variables uh, look like at present. We have things like synchronicity. Is it synchronous or asynchronous? Uh, is the message transmission one way or two way? Most CMC is one-way transmission, but two-way transmission is when you're typing and the other person can see you typing keystroke by keystroke, and you can see them typing keystroke by keystroke, and the cursor jumps back and forth between the two halves of the screen where you're typing. Uh, it was popular in the uh, 1970s in the earliest form of CMC. Um, um, uh, what I'm going to say... Um, uh, ICQ was an application in the late 90s, early aughts that had a two-way uh, interface as well, but they haven't proven to be very popular. Persistence of transcripts. How long does the transcript last? Is it ephemeral or does it hang around forever? Size of message buffer. How many characters do you have to type? Uh, Twitter is famous for having a limited message buffer size, although it's larger now than it used to be. Channels of communication. This would be things like text, video, audio, and so forth. 
uh, whether the system allows you to be anonymous, whether the system allows you to exchange private messages, whether the system allows you to filter out messages from other people and to quote uh, simply by hitting return, for example, in an email to quote the previous message. And finally, message format refers to such features as the nature of the header in email messages, uh, the uh, sequence of messages in blogs, and so forth. Situation variables um, involve the participation structure, whether it's public or private, uh, the degree of anonymity or pseudonymity that the participants choose, participant characteristics such as their demographics, their proficiency and experience, their roles and status, the purpose of the group and the goal of the interaction, the topic or theme of the group and the exchanges, the tone, uh, which can be characterized in many different ways, serious or playful, formal or casual, contentious or friendly, um, what kind of activities they are engaged in, is it a debate, uh, am I, uh, is somebody posting a job announcement? Are they exchanging information? And then norms. And norms operate in multiple levels. You have the norms of the organization, if it's organizational um, CMC. Uh, you have norms of social appropriateness for any given group or, or addressee. And you've got norms of language use, which might include uh, in-jokes and abbreviations. And finally, code refers to the language used, the register of the language, and uh, if relevant, the writing system. And these could be added to, but these are the ones that we have so far. Now, you may be wondering, well, what's the, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using these different methods? The modes have the advantage of being a convenient shorthand to refer to very complex phenomena. If I say email or blogs, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. I don't need to go into details about them. Um, but the disadvantage is that modes don't apply to new or experimental systems. They have to be systems that are already in use and widely known. And they can't explain patterns that cross cut modes like gender patterns. Um, it, they're also a very coarse granularity. Uh, email, for example, there can be many different kinds of email, many different kinds of blogs, just to say that blogs are a mode. Uh, masks a lot of information about different types of blogs, for example. And facets have the advantage of providing a precise characterization of any given CMD sample that you might collect. And it can be applied to any CMD. It doesn't need to be popular or widespread or anything like that. But the disadvantage is that it's somewhat verbose and it can be cumbersome, especially if you have to give a value for every facet, which is where the analytical synthetic approach comes in. You, you describe every facet, but then choose the ones that are most important, most salient, most revealing about your data. Uh, and where this comes in in doing CMD research is in the beginning when you've selected a sample and you want to characterize your sample, and also at the end after you've done your analysis and you're interpreting your results, uh, it's helpful to interpret your results in relation to the characteristics of the CMC itself. So, um, so far, we can say um, as takeaways from this uh, CMC or CMD is authentic communication that has features of both spoken and written language. CMD has many advantages as data for linguistic analysis. And CMC and, or CMD varies and can be classified according to medium and situation facets. Before going further, I'd like to say a little bit uh, about the history of linguistic studies of CMC. I've identified three phases having to do with the technology that was available. Uh, the first phase is the pre-web phase. The, the web really was introduced and became a thing I would say around 1993, 1994, and that was with the introduction of the first inline graphical browser in 1993, although the web was actually introduced a couple of years earlier than that. Um, web 1.0, we'll just say, uh, is this period of time uh, when the web starts to become popular and uh, people start to study it. And then web 2.0 was, was named that by, uh, a web entrepreneur, Tim Berners-Lee in 2004. It's somewhat of an arbitrary date, but we'll use that date and uh, say that that's it, the third phase going forward. 
And um, so I was not uh, one of the most early people to study computer mediated communication or computer mediated discourse. There was research that goes back to 1984, uh, 1985. Um, and um, three studies, uh, Naomi Barron published in a paper in 1984 kind of looking towards the future of what CMC was likely to do to language. Uh, and then there was some early work by uh, Shirsten Severance in Eklund in Sweden, uh, her dissertation work, and uh, Denise Murray uh, in Australia. And so uh, they are the true pioneers here. But when I got involved studying CMC, what we had available then was email, mailing lists, and Usenet news groups. And then a little bit later on, uh, IRC, and uh, AOL chat, uh, America Online, that is, uh, internet service provider, uh, and MUDs and MOOs, which are text-based virtual reality environments, uh, came along. And uh, what was interesting was that the, everything, every one of these you had to access using a different textual client. They were not interoperable, like we can now go through the web and access almost everything. Most users didn't even know that there were all those different kinds of CMC. Uh, so there was a lot of fragmentation going on. It was text only, uh, plus emoticons and a little bit of ASCII art. Um, and MUDs and MOOs, which are the virtual uh, text-based realities, created virtual spaces entirely through textual descriptions. Most of the users were tech-savvy males in English-speaking countries, especially the United States. And it was, uh, it was kind of the Wild West in the early days. Uh, but the early linguists who got interested in CMC focused on, uh, particularly on typography and orthography and morphosyntax. That is to say, the structural properties of, of computer-mediated language, which later came to be called NetSpeak, this sort of uh, abbreviated uh, informal variety of language that people were using online, especially in chat rooms. Um, and, um, and then also fairly early on, um, I started studying and some other people as well started noticing interesting differences in gender styles and gender power dynamics online, which I'll say a little bit about later on. Uh, another early, fairly early topic was uh, registers um, using um, Biber's work. Uh, if you're familiar, Biber and Finnegan's work on, on registers based on word frequencies and uh, message and sequence structure going into the early 90s. Then in phase two, more people started uh, coming on board with the advent of the World Wide Web. And that also meant more linguistic research. In terms of technology, there was more. Uh, now there was web chat and web forums and blogs and wikis, everything on the web, uh, but also graphical virtual worlds, which were not on the web, uh, instant messaging, ICQ, which I just mentioned, and SMS text messaging. Um, so uh, one of the features of this period was a kind of convergence of CMC modes in uh, web platforms. So now it became possible to access different kinds of CMC through the web. Starting in around uh, mid 90s, the internet started spreading rapidly to other countries too, outside uh, the English speaking world. We also saw an increase in number of female users uh, with uh, users reporting numerical parity uh, by 2000. That doesn't mean that men and women were using every all kinds of CMC the same, but that men and women reported accessing the web uh, equal amounts as of 2000. And in phase two, uh, we saw uh, now research on online community and identity um, as part of a broader interest in CMC in these topics, not just from linguists, but also from linguists and communication scholars. Um, there was gender research that was in, uh, influenced by postmodernism that was talking about how gender didn't exist online or how easy it was to switch genders and play with identity. And this was causing a breakdown of gender binaries. Um, there was some research on intertextuality related to hyperlinks on the World Wide Web. And uh, people interested in conversation analysis and interaction management came on board at this point and started looking at um, conversational characteristics. Also, this was when a research on language choice, code switching, and um, multilingualism online started as well. The third phase, um, we'll say arbitrarily starting in 2004 up through the present 
uh, saw the in introduction of media sharing sites like uh, video sharing sites and photo sharing sites, social network sites, microblogs like Twitter, <clears throat> and what uh, I'm going to call split modality platforms where somebody is broadcasting over video and other people are commenting in text chat. And so because of increasing bandwidth on the internet, we see now a lot more use of video, audio, and graphics, and also a tendency towards convergence of textual CMC with other forms of um, other modes of communication. And the web is now fully interactive at this stage. And there's a lot of research now that happens here, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but uh, on this slide, we have, for example, research that's focusing in on different modes of CMC. So uh, language use and instant messaging and text messaging and blogs and wikis on Twitter and Facebook, on YouTube, um, studies of special discourse communities like fans and rappers. Um, another uh, set of areas were um, areas that you might be surprised that nobody studied them before. Pragmatics really hadn't been picked up until uh, relatively recently and also sociolinguistic variation. Uh, we started seeing studies of language ideology and multilingualism continuing and language choice and code switching becoming uh, increasingly important. Also more uh, research on identity, um, now more detailed or more broken down into areas of specialization like race and ethnicity and quite a bit of research about young people, about adolescence uh, discourse online. Um, Non-textual modes, audio, video, graphics, split modality interaction, and offline and online interaction, um, recognizing the increase in multimodality online. Um, some areas that expand CMDA outside of its uh, core focus a little bit, automated corpus analysis, methodological expansions of CMDA involving, for example, ethnography, uh, work by Yanis Andritsopoulos was very instrumental there, um, more, a broader social and cultural uh, context for the interpretation of online behaviors, as well as the introduction of, of other theoretical approaches, um, such as relevance theory by Francisco Youth. Um, finally, there's some, some phenomena that people have studied sort of starting early on and continuing over the years. One of those is participation, um, another is humor, and another is language change. So the takeaways from these are uh, linguists have opened up a wide range of research topics involving digital language. Um, but the field is still open to discovery because new digital communication technologies are continuously being developed and launched. Uh, so it's one of the wonderful things about studying computer mediated communication and discourse is that it was a wide open terrain in the beginning and you could just stake out territory by saying, um, look, there's an interesting problem, I'm going to study it. And then you would become the first person to ever study it. And if you wrote about it, then everybody would have to cite your work because you were the pioneer in that area. Um, but it's wonderful to do that because then nobody else is there to argue with you about your interpretations, uh, unlike in areas that are more heavily researched. Okay, our, now we come to computer mediated discourse analysis. And this is a, a specialization within the broader interdisciplinary study of CMC, distinguished by its focus on language and language use and by its use of methods of discourse analysis to address that focus. And I am trained as a discourse analyst. I did my dissertation on discourse grammar, but uh, I've uh, mostly worked in other areas of discourse analysis since then. Now, CMDA is concerned primarily with reciprocally interactive CMC, although it doesn't have to be completely symmetrical, right? So we can have a uh, blogging, which is asymmetrical. The people who post the blog posts have more power than the people who post the comments, uh, for example. But we would include that here. Uh, one of the characteristics about CMDA that I want to introduce now, because I'm going to come back to it later, it's going to be important, is that um, uh, I defined it back in 2004 as language-focused content analysis. And uh, you'll find out more what I mean by that um, when I talk about methodology later on. Uh, 
what CMDA is, is it's not a theoretical paradigm. It's a set of methods. I call it a toolkit grounded in linguistic discourse analysis for mining network communication for patterns of structure and meaning broadly construed. It is theoretically agnostic. You could, um, you could work from different theoretical backgrounds and paradigms uh, and still use the methods uh, in the toolkit. And so here is kind of an overview summary of some of the things in the toolkit. What's important to notice, first of all, is the four levels of analysis from smallest to largest structure, meaning, interaction, management, and social phenomena. I've also listed here some issues that one might be interested in studying at each level, some phenomena uh, that would be useful to focus on, and uh, some methods from linguistics and other areas that might be useful to employ. So for example, if you were interested at the level of structure in orality and to what extent the CMD is, uh, incorporates features of spoken language, you might look at uh, typography and orthography uh, to address these issues uh, using uh, basic structural and descriptive linguistics, or you could also um, use a corpus and do corpus analysis. If you're interested at the level of meaning in what it is that speakers are intending to communicate through their utterances, uh, you might focus on speech acts, drawing on linguistic pragmatics. Or if at the level of interaction management, you're interested in how coherent um, multi-participant chat is, for example, you might focus on turns and uh, sequences um, using methods from conversation analysis. Finally, at the level of social phenomena, um, if you were interested in power dynamics, for example, you might focus on linguistic expressions of status and conflict and dominance, drawing on um, methods of critical discourse analysis, for example. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take an example, one example from each of these four levels and tell you something that hopefully is interesting, or at least that I find interesting about computer mediated discourse. So at the level of structure, we couldn't talk about structure without talking about so-called NetSpeak. NetSpeak is a term introduced in uh, 2001 by David Crystal. Um, by which he means a type of language displaying features that are unique to the internet. In other words, it's a variety of language unique to the internet that uh, Crystal believes is spread across all forms of CMC. And uh, I was once at a conference, I got myself in trouble again at another conference, the British Association of Applied Linguistics, I think it was 2002, um, and David Crystal was a plenary speaker, and he was talking about NetSpeak. And so I stood up gravely after his talk, and I asked him, because I could hardly believe what he was saying, that it was just one variety across all these different domains. I said, do you really mean that, you know, that you see this as being a variety for all languages, for all types of CMC, uh, for all kinds of speakers? And he doubled down on it, and he said yes. Although in his um, second edition of the, his book, the Internet Linguistics, he did allow that there were differences in the modes of CMC, that they had their distinguishing characteristics. But what we generally mean, what people mean when they talk about NetSpeak are, are, are things like uh, so-called relaxed orthography, letter number substitutions, uh, use of emoticons, expressive punctuation, acronyms like LOL, shortened words, repeated letters, and so forth. And we're all familiar with some of these, I'm sure. But the notion of NetSpeak as a single variety has been contested by many linguists, including Andrew Sokolos, um, Derscheid, who talked, Trista Derscheid, who talks about it as the myth of NetSpeak, uh, and uh, Trudy and Onesti as well, who say that you know, CMC is, is not a variety. There is no single variety. Um, in fact, what Trudy and Onesti say is that uh, CMC really just has features of different kind of features of both speaking and writing that are you know, blended together that kind of co-occur, uh, but that there's not really very much about it that is absolutely unique. Um, and I'd like to push back on that idea a little bit. But coming back to 
the argument against the idea that NetSpeak is a single variety. Uh, Marcus Biesfanger in 2007 did a nice little study where he compared NetSpeak in English and German text messages. And the premise was that um, shortenings are a major characteristic of text messaging that's technologically determined and thus, whoops, it ought to be true for NetSpeak in general. And this is kind of following uh, Crystal. And so what he did is he got a corpus, not a huge corpus, but a corpus of English text messages and German text messages by people between the ages of 17 and 30, collected in approximately 2000 and 2001. Uh, and they were similar in length, about 91 to 95 characters at that time. So, so we would expect that they would be similar. Uh, and he identified and counted six categories of shortening and compared the results for the two languages. So here's his categories of shortenings, uh, he, what he called initialisms, I, we usually call them acronyms, uh, English LOL, LOL, German, for example, HDL, Hadditiv, uh, I love you. Um, contractions like English don't, uh, or a missing contraction like don't without the contraction would be counted there, or uh, German Habs for hab, Habes, and Aufum for Aufdein. Uh, phonetic spellings in English like cuz for because and night for night, N-I-G-H-T, German leider for leider, sorry, and net for nicht, no. Uh, clippings, English info, b-day, um, but German also has these, um, A-N-T-W for on for it, answer, and mal for einmal once. And letter number homophones are only in English but not in German, so and this would be in English like to be or not to be, that is the question. Uh, and finally, word value characters like uh, an X in English stands for a kiss. In German, it refers to um, the word mal, like times, one time. Uh, the ampersand for and in English and the abbreviation, the letter H for uhr, meaning o'clock in German. And so these are the categories. And he uh, coded all of his examples manually and quantified the distribution. And this is what he found. Um, it's a little difficult to read, but on the top left, we have initialisms. You can see that uh, German has many, many more than English. Uh, then we have contractions below that. English has many more than German. Phonetic spellings, English has many more than German. Uh, clippings, English has more than German. Letter number homophones, German doesn't have any of those. And word value characters per message, English also has many more. So overall, English has uh, many more shortenings than German. And also, um, there is a case where German has more than English. And so it's not a simple picture. And so um, Biesfanger uh, concludes on the basis of this that it is not uh, right to say that NetSpeak is um, universal across languages. That NetSpeak varies uh, across languages. And if it varies between German and English, which are closely cognate languages, think how much it varies uh, across languages from different language families. Um, also, under the category of structure, people talk a lot about word frequencies. And I want to present to you a, a, what I found to be a very useful tool for studying the frequencies of words. Um, because one of the advantages of looking at word frequencies is that it can easily help you compare two data samples. It can help you understand uh, the differences between modes. Um, and so the tool is called uh, LUC, Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count. Some of you may have heard of it. I don't know, maybe you could type something in the chat if you've heard of it. I'm kind of curious to know how widespread LUC is. It's used quite a bit in the US. It came out of uh, psychology, but it's used a lot in linguistics as well. And one of the advantages of LUC is it has a web-based interface where it lets you input some data and it provides a comparison with other online and offline genres. So you can compare your, your results with others. So a little bit of background about LUC. It's a popular dictionary-based linguistic analysis software created by James Pennebaker uh, at UT Austin uh, in Texas. And the most recent version is Loop 2015. It includes 88 different categories of grammatical words and, um, and um, sort of semantic categories like cognitive words, happy words, sad words, words about sex. Uh, it, the words are pre-categorized, in other words. Uh, that's why it's a dictionary program. 
And users can also create custom dictionaries to, to customize them for your data, which is a nice feature. There's a free online version where you, you have a text limitation of 5,000 characters or about 1,000 words, uh, which I'm going to show you in a second. And you can also purchase the full academic version, or you can lease it. It costs about $89, and um, you can lease it, I think, for $10 a month, which my students do on a regular basis. So if you go to the web interface, this is what it looks like. Give it a try. And I have pasted in some of the text from the syllabus for my computer-mediated discourse analysis course. Um, and you can see the, the text is in there. And I have also selected above, uh, it says professional or scientific writing. There's a pull down menu and there are different genres that you can select for purposes of comparison. Let's see what we get. Okay, so here is the results. And on the right are the um, comparison results. So professional scientific writing, um, there's the numbers over there. And then our results are uh, to the left of that. Um, we only get the results for certain categories on the web. This is um, I, so first person pronouns, social words, positive emotions, negative emotions, cognitive processes. And then there are four what they call summary variables, um, which are measured a little differently. And analytic refers to the analytic nature of the text. Clout refers to the degree of, of confidence and authority with which it is expressed. Authenticity refers to uh, how um, self-disclosing it is, um, and emotional tone. If you have a score of 50, that means it's neutral. Anything above 50 is positive. Anything below 50 is on the negative side. So we can interpret our findings for my uh, course syllabus. Um, we have somewhat more social words in, in our syllabus than does other scientific or professional writing. Um, um, more cognitive processes. That makes sense because it's a graduate course. Um, oh, more clout. Oh, so my syllabus is more authoritative in its style. Um, and a more positive emotional tone. Um, but then conversely, um, we are less self-disclosing in this description of computer-mediated discourse analysis course. And there is absolutely no uh, negative emotions. So this is very useful, a very useful tool. Uh, the way Luke works is that it has two components, a text analysis module and dictionaries. So it first segments the text and identifies and categorizes words based on the dictionaries that are built into the tool. And then it calculates the frequencies, which by the way, I should have mentioned, um, the ones above the line are ratios per 100 words and the ones below the line are, are, are indices where they're a combination of frequencies of different categories. And then you have the dictionary, uh, which tells the text analysis module which words to identify and classify. And the classification uh, in the dictionary was done originally by human beings. It was done manually uh, and inter-rater reliability was calculated um, to assure uh, that there was agreement uh, among the coders. Now, Luke has a variety of dictionaries, including in many other languages. It's a little bit hard to see here, but we've got Spanish, French, Russian, Italian, Dutch, German, Brazilian, Portuguese. Uh, there's, there's different varieties of Chinese. There's quite a number of different language dictionaries. And then there are also custom dictionaries that other people have made that you can access if you purchase uh, use of this program. And those are listed below, like political issues, um, geography, football clubs, uh, security lexicon, German STEM dictionary, and so forth. Um, so if anybody's interested in MOOC, I will make my slides available. And there's some links here where you can access all kinds of information about it. Well, that brings us to the second level of CMDA, which is meaning. And uh, one of the things that I teach when I teach this course uh, is uh, about speech acts. Uh, and I want to focus right now and talk a little bit about speech acts, but specifically about virtual performatives, which are a rather unusual characteristic of computer mediated discourse. And uh, people who have studied this are listed here, Cherny, uh, Lynn Cherney and Tui Um, Some years ago, uh, together with some students, I created a taxonomy for coding computer mediated discourse. 
and it's uh, comprised of 16 acts. It's actually a composite and a distillation of some classic speech act taxonomies, um, Searles and um, Francis and Hunston's, uh, Francis and Hunston more oriented towards conversational discourse and Searle uh, works better with spoken discourse, I mean, with written discourse. So this is sort of trying to take the best of both of those and distill it into a simple, easy to apply uh, scheme that can be applied. Um, and so all of these acts are acts that can be found in offline discourse, inquire, request, desire, elaborate, thank, greet, manage, accept, reject, and so forth. But there is one act that is rather unique to CMC, and that's an act that I call behave. And that's when a certain behavior is performed. And in order to appreciate this, um, let me give you just a tiny bit of background, which for most of you, I'm sure is a refresher course in how performatives work in speech act theory in traditional language. Uh, the usage is that it, that's a performative utterance has to have a first person subject and uses a simple present tense verb. Uh, performatives are acts of communication, although not all acts of communication can be used performatively and uh, some require institutional authority. Um, actions and states cannot be used performative, performatively. And when I say performativity, I'm, I'm referring to um, uh, how to do things with words in the words of Austin. Um, uh, basically, you make something so by virtue of uttering it. So for example, um, I can apologize by saying I apologize for being late, and that is an apology. Uh, if I were a judge and had authority to do this, I could sentence you to 10 years in prison without parole just by virtue of saying that sentence. But um, if I say Susan apologize, ap apologizes for being late, that does not count as uh, an apology. Uh, if, I, if Susan is a third person, I'm simply describing Susan's behavior. Um, if I'm referring to myself, um, it's questionable whether that would be interpreted as uh, an apology just by virtue of saying that. I cannot complain by saying I complain about the new regulations. That doesn't constitute a complaint, it's more a habitual action. Similarly, I love cashews does not suddenly cause me to love cashews because I have uttered that sentence. And I cannot physically dance by saying I dance with joy, although it might be metaphorically understood as an expression of, of celebration. Now, in contrast, um, in early text chat, like internet relay chat and muds and moves, um, virtual performatives have a uh, somewhat different usage. So the subject is in the third person. Uh, and again, we've got the simple present tense. Uh, but now all acts of communication and actions can be used performatively. Uh, and you can also, um, uh, sentence someone to 10 years uh, in the virtual world. You don't have to have real life institutional authority to do that. Um, but there's a kind of ambiguity that arises with offline situations where something could either be performative or descriptive. Um, and I'll give you an example in a second. Uh, in these cases, people may choose to use the format of the virtual performative to take a particular perspective, as if they have an avatar in the virtual world that is doing something or believing something that is not necessarily the same as what uh, you yourself are doing or believing. So for example, I can say, I can type in, a, in, in a, an internet relay chat, Susan apologizes for being late, that's an apology, that's fine. Um, it can just be in the virtual world. It doesn't necessarily mean anything about um, what I'm doing in the real world. Susan sentences you to 10 years in prison without parole if we're playing a game about, about uh, courtroom. Uh, Susan dances with joy. I can do that. And that's virtually dancing. That is actually accomplished in dancing. This is an example of behave. Um, and then Susan complains about the new regulations. I can say this as a virtual performative, but I can also, if I'm maybe filling out a complaint about the regulations that I'm going to submit to a website, I can use the performative form uh, to take a certain perspective. Similarly, Susan, Susan loves cashews. Now I do in fact love cashews. So if I say using this construction, sorry, Susan loves, it should be, Susan loves cashews. Um, 
it's unclear whether my avatar is just saying that in the virtual world or whether it is a description of my offline state. And in, in, in effect, it, it's probably some of both. So these are these interesting characteristics of virtual performatives. Moreover, these virtual performatives have spread widely. And we probably, you probably know them better in shortened forms where there typically is not a grammatical subject. The verb can be a third person present tense form, or it can be uninflected, or it can be a nominal or an adjectival form. And we see these with acts of all kinds of acts of communication, actions, activities, and states, although often they're understood as descriptions of offline realities rather than uh, actual uh, performatives, but they have this performative form. So examples from my data here, some of them are enclosed in, um, in symbols to bracket them. Um, asterisks are very common. So blinks, yawn, gulp, giggle, meow, humph, sniff, spank, happy sobs, really fucking bored, points upward, and then without any brackets, lol, giggle, guffaw, kiss, hugs, wink, wink, inhale, I'm pretending to smoke marijuana, confused, chilling with the homies, drops to tie his shoe. Um, and then um, more recently, I just collected these last two examples, like within the past week. Uh, they're from Twitter. Um, somebody uh, said, sips tea. And then we have the emoji of tea and a, a shocked face. And uh, another example, going places uh, where there's a, a dancer and um, champagne glasses, which could easily have been written as going places, dances for joy, clinks champagne glasses, uh, using uh, virtual performative, uh, more traditional kinds of virtual performatives. So this is a very widespread phenomenon. In fact, LOL, laugh out loud, uh, may be one of the most characteristic features of net, net speak. Um, online. Now, these emoji are interesting. Uh, in the first case, sips tea, that is a behave uh, act, uh, because this person is not actually sipping tea at the time when they're writing this. They are actually talking about some particular brand of tea that they find a very strong. So they're virtually sipping the tea, and then they are enacting this sort of claim, oh, you know, the tea is shocking or the tea is strong, which is not a behave, that is more of a, of a claim or an evaluation. But for the second example, going places, that is not a virtual performative. She is, in this case, this is an online celebrity, is describing that she's in an airport and she's about to go someplace. So she's just describing what she's doing. But the emoji are um, a um, performative speech act the dances for joy and the clink champagne glasses. So we see that emoji now are the latest form of virtual performatives in social media. We come now to the third level of computer mediated discourse analysis, which refers to interaction management. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about turn-taking and particularly the phenomenon of what I call disrupted adjacency. This is when uh, an initiating turn is interrupted by irrelevant messages prior to the response. So um, if you are familiar with the notion of um, adjacency pairs, first pair part, second pair part, uh, if somebody, for example, asks a question and somebody else answers it, uh, disrupted adjacency is when other people post a bunch of messages in between that aren't related to that exchange. And this happens a great deal, especially with multi-participant uh, computer-mediated discourse. Um, and as part of talking about this, I want to also introduce another tool. This is a semi-automated tool that I created called Visual DTA. DTA stands for Dynamic Topic Analysis, and it's a method for understanding and visualizing the structure of how topics develop over time in an online conversation. So take, for example, this segment of discourse from Internet Relay Chat. Uh, we have in this, in this uh, little, little sample here, we have Loriana, Goose, Mohawk, Banana Fish, and Insomniac. Those are the players, the participants. And uh, as you'll see, as we read through, there are different conversations going on between the different participants. So Loriana says, I finished my book. This sucks. Goose says, Scott, we should meet at the Crown and Anchor again and drink. Mohawk says, reading makes you stupid. 
uh, Goose resumes, and smoke and be happy. Mohawk says, so I don't read. Banana fish says, cool. But I'd have to get someone to tell me how to get there. I have no clue where it is. Insomniac has joined Channel Texas. That's an automatically generated message. Insomniac is back. Uh, that's a performative. Uh, Loriana, I think I need to go to sleep. Loriana, reading made me too smart. Insomniac says, ha ha. Okay, how do we make sense of this? Um, it appears to be rather incoherent when you read it. And so what visual DTA does is it provides a visualization. Uh, and this is a visualization of this little sample. I've used color coding to show the different conversational participants. So we've got, I finished my book, this sucks. I think I need to go to sleep. Reading made me too smart. That's, um, that's one participant. Then we have um, um, this conversation between uh, Scott and uh, Goose, where uh, Scott, we should meet at the CNA and drink and smoke and be happy. And then Goose is in brown here, says, cool, but I'd have to get someone to tell me how to get there. Uh, and then we have Mohawk, who is sort of introducing himself in this conversation about reading. Reading makes you stupid, so I don't read. And then Insomniac comes in at the end and says, ha ha. Uh, so this is one way of visualizing this phenomenon of disrupted adjacency, which also shows us how we can have different conversations that are interleaved. A uh, very common characteristic of chat, but also you find it with um, web forums as well, with asynchronous CMC. Now, how does this work? Um, so in DTA, you code for two main things. The topic relation, that is to say the relation of a given topical proposition or idea unit with what it, what it is plausibly responding to. Uh, so this is the part that requires manual analysis because computers are not really very good at figuring out what a message is responding to unless the name is mentioned. And so there's three possible uh, codes here. It could be narrowly on topic, a parallel shift that preserves some of the same meaning but then introduces some bit of new meaning or a complete break from anything that's gone before. And then for parallel shifts, uh, they can be at different degrees of semantic distance from the original proposition. So it could be just a simple, um, simple short step where the relationship is immediately obvious, or it could be um, that the relationship is understandable, but you have to give it a moment's thought, or it could be that the relationship is only understandable after you really puzzle over it a lot. Um, and those sometimes look like breaks, but then you find you figure it out and you go, oh, that's what they mean. Oh, okay, okay. So that would be a three. And then by convention, we assign a four for a break. And so this is what the coding looks like in an Excel spreadsheet for this little sample. Now there's a column for uh, the speaker, uh, what each message responds to, the relation type, and the semantic distance. And optionally, you can indicate where you want to put dotted lines to indicate uh, uh, that a message responds to more than one thing, for example. So this is Visual DTA, and uh, you can try it out if you like. I've just got uh, one of my former students is creating a new online version, a web-based version that promises to be very easy to use once you've coded your data following the, uh, the guidelines that I just showed. So you can try it out. The last level of CMDA is social phenomena. Uh, and I want to focus on demographic variation, specifically on gender lex um, and gender-based disparity. Um, this is something that I worked on for a, a long time, especially in the early 90s. Um, it's encapsulated by a cartoon from 1993 that appeared in the New Yorker magazine, uh, where you have two dogs, where one is sitting at the computer talking to his doggy pal on the floor, and he says, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And this was really emblematic of um, beliefs that were going around about gender as well, uh, and other things like, like disability and race, um, that because textual CMC was really all the same for everybody, therefore, uh, people's um, backgrounds were invisible, and it was just a matter of your skill in typing or your rhetorical skill or whatever, uh, how you were perceived. Um, 
So I thought that wasn't true based on my early experience of looking at discussion forums. And so I conducted over the, a period of years in the early 90s, a sequence of studies uh, and other people also did some studies looking at uh, qualitative discourse analysis of email distribution lists, both academic and non-academic. And uh, this is kind of a summary of, of what we found that the male messages tended to be more impersonal, fact-oriented. They tended to make strong assertions, use more profanity, insults, sarcasm, rhetorical questions, and to make more challenges and disagree with others. Whereas female messages uh, were more likely to express emotion other than anger, uh, to be relation-oriented, um, to make mitigated assertions rather than strong assertions and use other kinds of non-declarative speech acts like questions, offers, and suggestions. Uh, the female messages tended to be more polite, they used more polite expressions, uh, and to express support and agreement with others. Uh, and this can be kind of schematically visualized uh, as, as these two um, distributions here where the, uh, the female style, first of all, there's a large area of overlap in the middle where you can't really tell, is it a man or a woman based on their discourse style. Uh, but towards the right, then you have this style that uh, I characterized as attenuated uh, and supportive, uh, which used a lot of positive politeness and uh, which was used almost exclusively by women. And all the way to the left, you have this style that I characterize as adversarial, uh, which was kind of anarchic or agonistic, uh, which at the extreme was used uh, pretty much only by men. So that was the distribution on these mailing lists. Well, come along a little bit later, there's blogs and blogs are popular. And so uh, Kennedy et al. Uh, were interested to see if there were these kinds of gender patterns on blogs as well. And so they analyzed comments in 20 A-list blogs and found uh, sure enough, women's comments were more inclusive and expressive, and men's comments were more assertive, competitive, and instrumental. They also found that women's blogs were mostly what were called diary-style blogs, where people were blogging about their personal lives and their thoughts and feelings. Uh, and the men's were mostly political filters. Filter blogs referred to blogs that talked about things external to the blogger. So it could be uh, news events, um, religion, whatever, anything, but not the, not the blogger personally. And so um, Herring and Paolillo then in 2006 uh, decided to analyze entries in a sample of blogs that were balanced for gender and blog genre. We said, what if you control for whether it's a diary or whether it's a filter blog? And so we got equal numbers of men and women posting diary blogs and filter blogs, and we analyzed their language looking at uh, structural features that had been found previously to be strongly correlated with gender. And we found surprisingly no gender differences, but we found genre differences. So the diary entries used what was thought to be the female stylistic features, which was notably uh, the use of personal pronouns, especially the first person. And the filter entries used what were thought to be the male stylistic features, which included things like noun determiners, demonstrative pronouns, and numbers. And so uh, this really caused me to rethink some of what I had been finding, that uh, at least in the case of blogs, that it looks as though the fact that women post, you know, have more diary blogs and men have more, uh, more filter blogs uh, could be um, why their language was different, not because of gender differences per se. And it raises the interesting possibility that a lot of gender differences that are found in other forms of CMC also um, may correspond to some extent with the topic of discourse. Now, unfortunately, because gender is identifiable in online communication, even in textual CMC, um, there are disparities in, in treatment that come about because of that. And this is also something that I looked at quite a bit in the 90s. Um, for example, in public mixed sex contexts such as academic discussion groups, women participate and are responded to less than men. Uh, women who advocate for women's voices or express views contrary to those of men may be accused of censorship and silenced. Uh, women are more often targets of harassment, especially sexual harassment in public chat rooms. 
uh, women's personal diary blogging attracts less attention and less favorable attention than men's so-called factual blogging uh, in the media. And uh, more recently, misogynistic online harassment persists uh, in social media and takes new and more severe forms such as revenge porn, rape and death threats uh, that are targeted disproportionately against women. And this is despite less anonymity in, um, in multimodal forms of CMC, especially social network sites where people post their profile pictures. And so uh, their, their gender is uh, much more or evident. Uh, so this has been called nonymity as a back formation from anonymity. Uh, and even when people are anonymous, they uh, will still harass even using their real, real names. So um, these are not pleasant um, findings to report, um, but it does show <clears throat> uh, some of the uh, real world um, uh, consequences of the, uh, the gender differences that, that we've identified in our research. So takeaways now from uh, CMDA, um, uh, NetSpeak features vary across languages at the structural level. Performativity works differently in textual CMC than in offline language. This is a rather unique characteristic of CMC, I would, I would say. Also, multi-participant online conversations are frequently characterized by disrupted adjacency. And this also is um, certainly much more common in, uh, in online communication. Imagine if you're at a cocktail party and there are a lot of people around you that are talking, how many different conversations do you think you could participate in? Well, you know, I've been in this situation. I think, you know, maybe one or two, right? If there's people standing next to me and they're talking about topic X, and then I'm this other group to the left of me is talking about topic Y, I could, you know, put in words in each conversation, but that's about the limit of it. Whereas in, in textual CMC, you have people, especially in chat rooms, participating in multiple conversations at the same time uh, and creating all this, uh, this disrupted adjacency. So um, this, I think, also is rather uniquely characteristic of CMC. Uh, and then finally, user-friendly tools exist to support CMDA, such as Luke and Visual DTA. Uh, and I could give you other examples of, there's a lot of tools also that provide structural descriptive statistics, like about things like use of passive voice and um, lexical variation, um, type token ratio, things like that uh, in many languages. So there's lots of tools for structural descriptions. And these are, when I say user-friendly, I mean off the shelf. You don't need to have any kind of programming uh, skill to use them. Okay. Um, let's turn now briefly to some methodological considerations. Remember I said that CMDA is language-focused content analysis. Now I want to tell you what that means. Um, particularly, um, it incorporates, it, it draws from content analysis in data sampling and in data coding, what we call coding, which is really data classification, and in reliability, coder reliability assessment. So sampling, when you select a sample of data, um, the, there's different kind of approaches that can be used. And, and the typical argument for using one more than another is uh, has to do with generalizability, which is the extent to which your findings will generalize to other similar data. And the most generalizable sampling method is random sampling. Now, true random sampling on the internet is impossible because you have to know the totality of what is available in order to sample randomly from it. And so what often happens is that people will sample within a specified domain, uh, sample randomly. Uh, we don't use random sampling very much, though, in CMDA and discourse analysis, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, and then there's systematic sampling, which would be, for example, taking the first X number of messages from a number of different um, threads or you know, taking every fifth method message from the threads. Those would be systematic methods. And then there's judgment sampling or purposive sampling where you have a criterion for, uh, that um, guides you in choosing the data for analysis. And finally, the least generalizable is the convenient sample where you might have some data that's ready to hand or that you just personally find interesting. 
um, but that you didn't select uh, for any sort of systematic reason. So more specifically with for CMDA, um, and this is from a 2004 chapter um, where I laid out some different um, CMDA methods and talked about the advantages and the disadvantages. You can see that for random sampling, a disadvantage is the loss of context and coherence. You really, um, uh, really want to keep context when you're doing discourse analysis as much as possible. Uh, and then the middle ones are all breakdowns of different kinds of judgment criteria that might be used in sampling. Like you might sample by theme, all messages in a particular thread, by time, all messages in a particular day or week or month, by phenomenon, for example, only instances of joking or a conflict negotiation, by individual or group, all messages posted by an individual or members of a demographic group, for example, all messages by students or all messages by women, and then there's a convenience sample, which is generally dispreferred because it's unsystematic um, and it may not be best suited to the purposes of the study. So which sampling method should you use? Uh, it depends on your research questions. What phenomena are you interested in? Do they occur frequently? Uh, you might want to use a judgment sampling method if you're interested in something that doesn't occur all that often. You need to collect enough instances of it to be able to analyze it. Um, data, how much is there and how accessible is it? Uh, if there's not a whole lot of data, maybe you can analyze it all. You can do exhaustive sampling. Um, and then finally, uh, how important is it? This is what I always ask my students. How important is it that your results generalize beyond your sample? Why would you want them to generalize beyond your sample? Well, one reason is you've done all that work doing your analysis. And if it only sheds light on the data that you analyzed, other people could look at it and say, well, that's you know kind of nice and you've explained your data very well, but what does that have to do with anything else? So it's nice when your results generalize because then they can inform other people's research in a broader way. But it may not always be important to have generalizable results. Sometimes uh, you might want to do a case study or focus in narrowly on a particular community of users because they're interested for one reason or the other. Um, so another thing that we do sometimes in CMDA that comes from content analysis is a, a data coding. Uh, co uh, content analysis is often described as a coding and counting approach. And by coding, we don't mean computer, uh, you know, writing computer code. Uh, we use the word in the sense of manually assigning uh, each feature of interest in the data to a category according to a coding scheme. And uh, where do you get a coding scheme? Well, you can find them in previous literature that you can apply to your data. Um, or you can modify an existing framework or combine existing frameworks, depending on uh, what's in your data set. Or you can allow the schemes to emerge from the data. This is called the grounded theory approach. And this is especially useful when you're analyzing data that no one has ever analyzed really before. You know, when you're breaking new ground, a lot of times there are not existing coding, there are not coding schemes that already exist. Um, or you can do some combination of the above. These are all different sources. And then after you have a coding scheme, you describe it in a code book. And this is also something that I do, I recommend. And a code book is not an actual book, but it's just a document that lists the variables in a study and possible values for each variable with the definitions of codes uh, that have been assigned to each. And so here's a little example of that. I didn't give definitions here, but here's like a little mini coding scheme uh, that shows the variables and the values if, for example, if you were using the CMC ACT taxonomy that I mentioned earlier. And so you might have a variable which is CMC ACT and you would choose one of those ACTs, um, the 17 ACTs. Um, there's also two meta categories in the, in the taxonomy. There's perspective, which is either, you know, what you're saying is your own perspective or you're reporting somebody else's perspective. And sincerity, whether it's a bona fide utterance or whether it's non bona fide utterance, like if it's uh, ironic or sarcastic. And so uh, that's an example of variables and values. And because semantic variables may be subjective, intercoder reliability measurements are recommended. And uh, what that is, 
is um, if you're coding um, things where people could disagree uh, about how to apply those codes, it's a good idea to do um, to measure how much different coders agree in order to be able to report that result. Uh, this lends rigor to an analysis. Um, so it's the degree to which an instrument measures the same way each time it's used under the same condition with the same subject. In other words, somebody else could take your data and your coding scheme and apply it and get the same results. That's what you want. And this is especially important for semantic and pragmatic uh, and social phenomena. And I'm not going to go over this because I want I do want to leave um, time for questions. Uh, and I'm going to go over it in detail. But basically what happens is uh, in advance, uh, different people, different coders code a part of the data. They go off, they do it themselves, they come back, they go over their codes, they see where they agree or disagree. If they don't agree uh, at, to reach a sufficient threshold, they go back, they take a new sample, they code it by themselves again, they come back, uh, they see how much they agree, and they keep doing this and refining the coding system until they reach an acceptable level of agreement. And in discourse analysis, because uh, because discourse reflects human thought and behavior and humans are messy, it's uh, not easy to reach 100% agreement on some categories. And so we often will say 80% agreement is an acceptable level. However, the interpretation depends on the number of coders and the number of possible categories for each code. So if your code is yes or no, those are your two values for your variable, then people might agree just by random chance. And so there's uh, different kind of measures that can control for that. I'm not going to go through all of this now, just to so you know, percent agreement is the simplest and most basic, but also the least rigorous. And this is just the number of coding decisions upon which all coders agree, divided by the total number of coding decisions. You have other ones. Holstein's coefficient of reliability takes into account that different coders might have different frequencies of codes, like they might have skipped some or they might have co double coded some things. And then you have more sophisticated statistical measures that take into account uh, agreement occurring by chance. And you have that for two raters or for multiple raters. And finally, the gold standard is Krippendorf's alpha, uh, which handles any number of raters, different kinds of metrics, missing data, small sample sizes, you name it. Uh, and it's uh, something you don't want to try to do by hand, but there uh, is a program that can help you do that. So. These are different ways that uh, we introduce greater methodological rigor into CMDA uh, by incorporating best practices from content analysis. OK. Um, there's a lot that I could say about multimodality. This is something I've been working on almost exclusively in the past several years. But I'm just going to say a few, make a few points here. Um, of course, uh, the phenomena include text, audio, video, graphics that more and more are converging together on single platforms. Uh, and they pose challenges because CMDA was developed for the analysis of text. Uh, we may need to draw on other kinds of methods, even methods and insights from outside linguistics. And you, we need both mode specific understandings, but we also need holistic understandings of how different modes work together. And so um, two things that I've worked on recently, one is graphicons, graphical icons in CMC, and another is um, discourse and split modality platforms. And for graphicons, um, there's two views. I, I want to just say, say a few words about emoji because they're the most popular kind of graphicon. And there's two, kind of two views about emoji. One is that they just express paralinguistic cues. They substitute for prosody and gesture. Um, and uh, another view is that they're exhibiting emergent language-like properties. Uh, these views are not actually incompatible, but, but people tend to disagree about it. Uh, and so, for example, I've been working a lot with uh, um, um, Chinese scholar looking at Sina Weibo, which is the Chinese Twitter. Um, and looking at emoji sequences there. And that has led me to believe that emoji are really uh, taking on language like properties. And so here's some examples. They can combine to form words like iPhone uh, or this example here, no house frown, which means uh, homelessness. 
Uh, they can combine to form phrases like uh, noun noun phrases like chicken soup, adjective uh, modification of nouns, uh, colorful moist lips. Uh, and this wonderful example of adverbial modification uh, of an adjective where the first two emoji represent are conventionally represent an act of sexual intercourse. And they're used here uh, in an abstract grammaticalized sense of uh, intensification, effing crazy. Um, emoji combined to form sentences as well, like what, do, when does school start? Question uh, time school. And uh, in the past, children teased me about my buck teeth, literally back children tease me who has buck teeth. And uh, in this last example, word order is important. It's not I tease the children, it's the children tease me. And we know that because emoji sequences in English tend to follow English word order, which is subject, verb, object. But in uh, Sina Weibo data, uh, it's object, verb, subject. So this uh, here example of you all thank I, female, does not mean you thank me, it means I thank you, because we've identified an object verb subject order in Sinawebo emoji sequences, which is different, interestingly, from the basic word order of Chinese, which is subject verb object, same as English. So there's some pretty compelling evidence, I think, of emoji having linguistic properties. Um, however, just because there are structural patterns emerging doesn't mean that people understand emoji in the way that they're intended by others. And so here's an example of a conversation between a couple who decided they were going to communicate purely in emoji for a week to see what happened. And uh, they had quite a bit of miscommunication that arose. In this particular sequence, she was intending to, to communicate, don't come to drinks because my friend has just had a death in the family. And he understands that she's saying she's sad because he's not there. So, um, Emoji meanings have not yet become conventionalized to the point that they can operate uh, independently from text. And just a couple words about split modality platforms. This is another uh, emergent phenomenon where different individuals engage in an online conversation or discussion through different modes, one of which is video and another of which is text in real time on the same platform. And people also call this cross-modal video media, video mediated communication, cross-modal exchanges in previous research. Uh, and it, this poses challenges uh, because you need to have a cross-modal transcription scheme uh, and match up voice with text. Um, you need to define comparable units of analysis, voice and text units, find or adapt analytical methods that make sense for both modes and construct a holistic analytical framework to bring it together. And um, I just mentioned a couple of studies here, this one by Rosenbaum, Raffaele, and Corzon in Israel, where they looked at um, Google Hangouts, multi-party, multimodal video chat, and analyzed participation about how people could be mobile and move from one mode to the other. Uh, and uh, they used conversation analysis methods um, and identified especially the use of um, visual cues to try to gain and hold the conversational floor. And here's another study um, by Rechtenwald about Twitch TV. Twitch TV is a gaming platform, uh, which similarly has a uh, live text chat and, and video. Uh, and uh, Rechtenwald devised a transcription scheme for coding the text chat and the video speech, as well as the gameplay that's going on in the background, which seems like a very useful contribution uh, to this research going forward. Okay, like other computer mediated discourse, these multimodal phenomena involve verbal language plus other semiotic systems in this case. They mediate human to human communication, they support social interaction, and thus I would argue they constitute computer mediated discourse as well. So linguists should study them. However, I wanna leave you with a broader question. This is a question that I have asked myself a lot over the years, I was trained as a linguist um, but I got interested in CMC, and as CMC continues to evolve, linguists who study CMC have a choice. Do we remain within the borders of known linguistics methods and approaches, including traditional CMDA, if you will, or do we follow the technology where it leads, including beyond linguistics to study CMC in all its forms? I have taken that latter road, uh, which I think is the road less traveled. Um, 
And so speaking of roads, this brings us to the end of our road, which is the conclusion. I hope in this, uh, in this talk that uh, you have taken away certain ideas. Um, first and foremost, CMD can be a valuable source of data for linguistic analysis. And I didn't say a lot about this, but of course you can use uh, traditional, answer traditional language questions um, using CMC data, um, but also, of course, you can analyze phenomena that are specific to CMC. Uh, if you do, then you need to understand and describe the nature of the data and the data sources because the different technical and situational features of the CMC can affect linguistic behaviors. Um, also, there's a need to go beyond traditional methods. Um, and it may be useful. I have found it useful to borrow from content analysis and visual semiotics, for example. Uh, finally, resources are available from existing studies. Uh, more and more people, uh, linguists are studying online uh, discourse, but there are still many opportunities available to stake out new territory because uh, there's always new technology coming along. And uh, so this is a great way to make your mark in the field um, by striking out and, and claiming and discovering something new. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And I will now turn to all the questions in the chat. I can see there are 57 questions in the chat. So let me... So Susan, uh, before going to the questions, I thank you very much for, uh, we thank you very much um, for this. <laughs> For this amazing talk, uh, this amazing overview on on CMC and CMD methodological and theoretical issues, and I think you raised a lot of questions. Um, and so let's uh, go to the questions. Uh, how do we proceed? Do you do you want to read some of the questions that are in the chat, or maybe people raise his her hand and. Uh, you go to, with the questions as you prefer. Um, I'm looking at the text. Okay. Uh, is Luke available for languages other than English? Yes, many, many languages other than English. Um, so somebody has seen letter number homophones in German. Yeah, I'm not surprised, uh, but I might, must have been not in his data in, uh, in 2000, 2001 when he collected the data. Yes, thanks a lot. I, I did not see the date, but I was thinking, then I was thinking, yeah, it's a very long time ago. <laughs> yeah, quite yeah. a long time ago, yeah. And a fairly small sample. I think he only had okay. like um, 357 German messages or something like that. Okay, but I also could not, I think this is very typical, like, good night, good night, but I did not, uh, I was trying to think about it. I, it's not a lot still, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what comes to my mind? Yeah, so it would still be more and more in English. Yes, I think, yes, I think, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, does it use, does Luke use the same principle as keyword in context? Uh, no, uh, I think you're thinking of a concordancing program and Luke is a dictionary program. So a concordancing program shows you the word in the context of the utterance, but you know, the words on either side of it. Um, and concordancing programs are also very useful for, for doing discourse analysis online. Um, but no, Luke is a dictionary program, which means that they have taken all the words in the English language, or as many of them as they could do, and classified them into categories. Uh, and that is what the dictionary uh, knows. And so when the dictionary sees a word like um, um, depressed, for example, it might classify it as um, negative emotion. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about orthograph <laughs> on the mm -hmm. Facebook interaction. People remember ICQ. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. AntConc, right. AntConc is a concordancing program. That's a good one to use. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, basic one. It's a good tool to start. Yep. OK. Um, OK, Carlotta. Uh, oh, yeah, good. You're talking about R. 
Okay, sips tea, reminds me of a meme. Such patient, uh-huh, yeah. Oh, speaking of memes, the most, uh, I didn't mention it, but one of the most popular virtual performatives uh, in early CMC was somebody hit somebody around a bit with a, with a wet trout, or somebody slapped so-and-so with a wet trout. And uh, that was a very popular meme, and it, it persists to this day in, in internet relay chat and in all kinds of other forums. Um, okay, question, are, are all these rules relevant for a trans Described linguistic online tandem two. Okay, I'm afraid I am not understanding that question, Massimo. Are all these rules relevant for a transcribed linguistic online tandem? What's a linguistic online tandem? If you want, Massimo, if you want to talk, you can clarify. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, uh, <laughs> I, I wrote. Uh, very bad way but i wanted to say because i'm um i'm studying uh linguistic tandems we just it's, it's just um a conversation online i am doing this online and it's just conversation uh, between two speakers of two different languages okay oh. so i'm doing this in uh with, with a chinese um partner so we we, we are going to, to speak half an hour um in italian and half an hour in chinese and um oh, okay. and then I'm, I'm going to uh transcribe all the um, uh, all the conversation and i will need to analyze this this transcribed conversation mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm wondering if if i can uh i can um Take, take, take all these rules you you, uh, you explained to, to study these conversations, even if they are not uh, written conversations, but they are online and transcribed. Ah, I see, spoken, transcribed conversations. Yeah. Um, yes, of course, um, you, can use, you can use the same methods to study uh, transcribed speech. Um, the behaviors, I mean, the patterns and behaviors may be somewhat different because speech is different from writing and from text CMC, but uh, there's no reason you couldn't use the methods. Um, the results might not be comparable in the same way to textual CMC, but then you don't necessarily want to compare it to textual C CMC. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no reason why you couldn't use the same approaches to transcribe uh, speech. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, uh, while um, having the conversation, we also write something. So um, maybe it, it's, it will be relevant to the study too. And it's, it's some like a mix of spoken and written. Yes, yes. Uh, this is the yeah, split modality interaction. Yeah. So I just finished a study uh, looking at Instagram Live. Instagram Live is like Facebook Live, which is like Twitch, which is like YouTube Live, where somebody is video broadcasting and other people are typing text chat. Um, but there's, I mean, if you have a Skype conversation or even for that matter, a Zoom conversation, we can talk over video, but we can also text, type text, right, at the same time. So these are all examples of split modality uh, platforms. And uh, I would just say in that case that you want to think about your transcription system so that you match up the speech with the text temporally. So you have some kind of like a chronological uh, running um, um, uh, notation along one side, and then you, you match when the speech occurs in relation to when the text occurs so that you can relate what people are typing to what they're saying. Yes, thank you very much. This is a very good advice. Thank you very much. I will use it. <laughs> Okay, thank good. you. Thank you very much. Um, I see a question from Andre, if you want, and Mariana, to we'll just switch from chat to okay. spoken yeah, yeah. questions. Do you, do you actually, since you're looking, do you want to read the questions to me? And do you yeah, can sure. Choose, you can choose sure. which one. But before I think, if you, Andre, go want to, to ask something. Okay. Uh, Mariana, you can go ahead, and then I'll go after you. Or Mariana. Oh, okay, thank you. All right. So, Thank you, Susan, for the great talk. I really enjoyed it. And I have worked in the past on uh, emoji with a colleague and we collected 
um, how people would express abstract concepts through emojis, mm. abstract concepts. So concepts that don't have a tangible reference, like, I don't know, uh, career or excellence or, uh, you know, freedom, you know, things mm. like that. Mm. And then we manually annotated all the strategies that people use to express abstract concepts through emojis. Mm -hmm. And one of the strategies that we observed besides metaphorical mappings and metonymies and so on, we found something that, I don't know whether that's also in English, the word rebus, basically mm -hmm. a puzzle. So people would actually use the images, the emojis, mm. for the sounds. So for example, to transcribe belief, you know, the, a belief, which is a very abstract concept, they would use the emoji for the B bzz, mm -hmm. and the leaf, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's a sort of a phonological strategy. Yep. Yeah, and I yeah. was wondering yeah. whether you found anything because um, you showed a slide where you showed some syntactic and morphological strategies mm -hmm. to use emojis as a language, actually. And, and we, we observed this phonetic somehow strategy. So if you represent belief, the concept belief with a B and the leaf, it has nothing to do with the meaning of the B and the meaning of the leaf. It's just the sound of the words, you know? Uh -huh, uh -huh. I was wondering whether you found anything like that or... Well, first of all, I wanna say that's absolutely fascinating and I hope you've written something up about this because I want, want to read it. Yeah, um, we did, we did. I will send so it in, to you, thank in you. In the <laughs> Chinese data, in the Chinese data that we've analyzed, um, there were some examples of rebus writing, not a whole lot though. Um, and I think that people tend to do that more when they're translating, you know, when like you tell them to translate a concept and they also tend to follow, you know, like if you do this in English, they, they're more likely to follow English word order if they're translating. Uh, or they're more likely to substitute word emoji for words as kind of a calcing process. So I think that's part of it. But you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of fingerspelling in sign language. Right? You know, because if you don't yeah. have a sign for something, you can always fingerspell it. That's right. Yeah. So you, that's you know, you don't, you don't have an emoji. You, you can use, uh, you know, phonological processes. That's great. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. So, go ahead. Can I go ahead? Please. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'm, I thoroughly enjoyed this presentation, Suzanne. Um, I'm here in Jamaica, and so I had to join from about 1 a.m., uh, but it was really, really worth it. I saw that most of the things that you spoke about were reflected in my MPhil thesis on Twitter language in Jamaica, which has not been studied before at least before I did that and completed it in 2016. So that made me very happy to follow um, this kind of discourse analytic approach, which is what I used too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you though, for some clarity on what you, on behave. What mm -hmm. exactly does it mean? I mean, from the presentation, I got a sort of essence. I got the gist mm -hmm. of what you were saying, but I wanted a little more clarity on mm -hmm. what, what yeah. you mean, especially in the context of performatives, et cetera, and mm -hmm. a little more on how the conversation you used in the presentation was reflective of disrupted adjacent, adjacency. Mm -hmm. And then exactly. I have a little comment on SIP C based on what I've been seeing here in Jamaica, but let me ask you to deal with those two first. Okay. Um, so first of all, the behave is, um, is to perform an action. Uh, it's not uh, an act of communication. That's what distinguishes it from all the others. I, this is actually an act that Francis and Hunston include in their speech act taxonomy of uh, conversational behavior, I mean, in conversation. And for them, a behave is, you know, like if I say, you know, please open the window and you go and open the window, that act of going to open a window is an act of behaving. So it's possible to have behavior in the, in the physical world. But mm -hmm. in, uh, in CMC, where I see it most often, where it's, it's most used is for these virtual performatives 
where somebody says like, you know, Susan dances with joy. Uh, in the virtual world, I'm dancing. You know, I'm not really dancing. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay, so that means Sip Steven is a kind of behave, you'd say, no? Which is? Would you categorize oh, the comment yeah. Sip Steve? Sips tea, right, because the person was not actually sipping tea at the time they wrote that. They were virtually right. enacting this, you know, sipping tea. Oh, so it wouldn't constitute behave for you? No, it is a behave. That one is. Oh, it is? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Oh, so there's two things going on in that example. So the sips tea, and then you have the tea emoji and the face, the shocked face. And there's actually a, a photo that goes along with that, where it says something about how this tea is incredibly strong. So the way I interpret the emoji sequence is, um, you know, I was shocked by the tea, or you know, I had this reaction to the tea. But that's not a behave. That's they're not reacting. Well, maybe it is. Gosh, that's a little bit ambiguous. But the the sips tea part. Uh, is clearly not what that person was, not a description of what that person was doing at that moment. It was like they came across this ad for this very strong tea. And so they're, they're play acting, basically. They're, you know, virtually enacting the, the act of sipping tea and then having this reaction to it. I guess if you think of it that way, the reaction is also part of the virtual performance. Whereas in the other example where the woman is in the airport and she types something like um, going places, She's just describing what's happening. She's not virtually going places by typing. Right. Uh, so that's not a behave. But then she has these emoji sequences uh, of you know dancing and uh, and clinking champagne glasses, and those are virtual performatives because she's not actually dancing and she's not actually drinking champagne. She's just dragging her suitcase through the airport. And she says a picture that goes along with this. So. Um, yeah, I mean, so you have to make you have to make judgments about, you know, is this happening in the physical world or is this happening in the virtual world? Uh, or is it possibly happening in the physical world, but for some reason they're using this virtual performative structure, maybe to take a kind of a, of a distance um, to avoid responsibility. I mean, there could be various reasons why they might want to do it just to be playful. Uh, it's uh, yeah, anyway, there's a lot going on with there, but I probably right. should move on and, and not you know dwell on that too much. But you know, I'd be happy mm -hmm. to have a conversation more about virtual performatives because it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, right. but then your, your second question was about that example about disrupted adjacency. Right. Right. Yeah, so so it for example, the um Moose, I believe was his name, um suggests to his friend Scott that they go out and have a beer, you know, have some drinks in a pub. And uh, so he originally suggests it, and then um, this other guy comes in and interrupts it and makes a snarky comment about the woman who was reading. And mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, so there's, there's at least a little bit of disrupted adjacency there. But then if, if we were to go back and look at the slide, you would see that there's uh, um, a, a bigger chunk of disruption between the guy who says reading makes you stupid and then she later on says reading made me too smart you know so then there's like four or five other messages that come in between right 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 um i'm interested in talking with you probably off the air because i mean there are other questions yeah. and comments about um the some of these things especially as they're re reflected in the jamaican context i'd love to hear more about it and more about your uh, dissertation research as well I don't think okay. I've come across it, yeah. All right, I'll definitely share it with you. Great. I, I think we have um, uh, four questions. Uh, Maria Angela, do you wanna to take, to just open the mic and? Yeah, yeah, thank you, it's okay. a pleasure. Thank you, Professor Arin, it was fantastic to hear you. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if we can also consider facial expressions, a kind of uh, real emoji, and they perform like speech acts. I don't know, I'm trying to be clear because I'm, I'm investigating uh, academic discourse perform in synchronous uh, video lectures. And I was looking at speech act performed by the professor to, 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 to see if there is a kind of switch in power relations uh, uh, from computer mediated lectures compared to 
face-to-face -face lectures, at least in, in, in okay, in English medium instruction lectures in Italy. And I was looking also, and it has been argued recently that since we are online and the camera mainly shows our face, we're increasing our facial expressions because we, um, you know, our gestures move up to the face. So I was wondering if we can also consider facial expression, expressions as a kind of, you know, performative, virtual performative act. Mm. I don't know if I, if I ask a student, uh, are you really sure what are you going, what are you saying? And I can do things like, uh, hmm? and it, this is very performative, I don't know, in, in a way. That's it, thank you. That's absolutely, um, gosh, you know, so this paper that I just wrote about um, uh, split modality interactions with, uh, it was beauty influencers, two young gay males, one in Spain and one in California. And we ended up in the, it's uh, a paper is about face work and how they're performing identity. The influencers are performing identity through the video broadcast. But we ended up proposing a dual conception of face, the physical face being relevant as well as the social face. And uh, particularly with beauty influencers, you know, they're wearing makeup, they're, they're vamping for the camera, they're drawing attention to their face in very, various ways. And then the audience in the chat is also asking questions about, oh, I love your, what shade is your lipstick, you know, and this, that, and the other thing. So there's this whole discourse that goes around, on around the physical face. And we end up suggesting something similar to what you just said, which is that this really has broader relevance for, for video media mediated communication more generally, even like in Zoom meetings. So it's not necessarily that people are, you know, makeup influencers or anything like that, but just that the camera uh, makes the physical face salient by virtue of having it be so close. Okay, thank well, you. thank you, thank you. There's another question by uh, Rosalba Nodari about emojis, it appears to me that there is a clear social linguistic pattern going on. For example, I tend not to use them. It is possible that they're used to relate it not to classic social linguistic variables, but to other variables such as internet usage. Mm -hmm. Hope that I... <laughs> well, we know that's true, um, <clears throat> that there are certain groups who use emojis more women use them more than men, young people use them more than older people. Um, we did a study of how people understand emojis when they encounter them in natural Facebook examples, and we found that uh, older males were more likely to say, uh, either interpret them very literally or say, I don't know, I don't understand whereas younger females uh, had all these, understood all these, uh, you know, uh, other kind of conventional associations with the emoji and liked the emoji more and used emoji more. So definitely there's uh, age and gender uh, demographic differences in terms of emoji usage. Um, I'm sure there's individual differences as well. Some people use them and other people don't, even among internet users. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm sure there. I'm sure that is correct. And another question from Agnese San Pietro, uh, somehow connected the, to the to the question uh, uh, of Rosalba is: uh, What concepts from visual semiotics do you find useful to analyze multimodal data? Uh, so emojis and other and other multimodal data. Do you consider social semiotics a proper method to analyze CMC data? Agnese, hi, I just saw you at uh, the Emoji 2021 workshops. <laughs> um, that's a kind of a tough question because I haven't personally drawn on um, visual semiotics uh, in my emoji research, um, but I have read works where people find, uh, find it useful in looking at um, image memes and uh, GIFs which are more complex visual um, representations. Um, not to say that you couldn't use do semiotic analysis of emoji. It's just not something that I've done. Do you have thoughts about it yourself? 
Uh, yeah, so I was wondering if some um, um, uses of um, social semiotics uh, could be uh, applied to emoji text uh, relations. Mm. Um, yeah, that seems potentially fruitful. Um, I, I did use, I did do a study um, with Jingji where we were in Chinese again comparing the uh, relationship of emoji sequences to the text that they followed. And we used rhetorical structure theory uh, for that, but I could see uh, using uh, social semiotics as well. So I think that's a, that's a good idea. It's not something I've done. Nice to see um, you again. There's a last question uh, coming from Darius. I don't know if, Please, do you, do you want to ask, opening the mic? Uh, the, the question is... Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes, so I'm here. Um, Go ahead. Th thank you for the talk. Um, I think my impression is a, a little basic. Um, I was just wondering, virtual performative, um, I understood it as um, getting things done with words. So you talk and then, I mean, we see it happening. So a pastor names a child, a pastor baptizes someone and all that. Yeah, so I'm wondering that um, if emotions are fake on the internet, how reliable are these for our linguistic analysis if we want to really understand the real communicative intent of our um, maybe participants or people we get data from. Um, so I, I think there's there's two things there, right? One is the trustworthiness of the of the data sources, uh, and another is the, is virtual performatives. And I think virtual performatives are not necessarily true. In fact, they're they're by definition only virtually true, right? And they should be only virtually true. And people use them a lot when they're play acting. It's, a, it's generally a very playful kind of thing to do. Um, and, uh, you know, like if I say, I, I hereby sentence you to 10 years in prison without parole, um, you know, we're, we're having maybe, a, we're playing it as kind of a courtroom drama or something like that. It has no, you know, its truth value is, is not relevant. Um, okay. But it is, but it has happened in the virtual world. Let me give you an example. So one of the things about virtual performatives is that they're non-cancelable or non-deniable. So if um, I you know, slap you uh, over the head with a wet fish, you might protest, but you cannot reverse that action. That action will have happened virtually simply by my, virtu my, by my typing it. Um, so that's another characteristic of virtual performative. So I think I think whether they're true or not is is probably not really really relevant, uh, because they're playful by definition. Thank you. And no, you know, the last I, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I see all these comments that I don't have time to read in the chat. I I hope that um, that uh, somebody can save the chat and share it with me after. We're doing it. We're saving. We're saving Wonderful. all the chats uh, every day, every workshop, and every plenary, so they will be available for all Great. of us. So they they can be analyzed as Maria Angela has suggested, and I definitely think it's a great idea, <laughs> <laughs> even without emojis. Or, but there are a lot of emoticons, I guess. So there's a, a last question by Eugenia. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was highly informative and very, very fascinating for me. I have just a curiosity. Um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the use of emojis and visual representation in general in a written uh, context where this, the dominant speech tone is very formal. Because I know that they are commonly associated with informal and casual speech, but I have found many instances where they actually used also in informal speech. So uh, I was wondering, what, what do you think about this? Why they're used in this context? Yeah, I think that's so interesting because what that suggests is that the emojis are becoming pragmatically unmarked for their, uh, their values of emotional intensity. And this is a process that seems to happen over time. So when a new graphicon is introduced, if you think about the history, 
of graphicons from emoticons to emoji. Um, emoticons have been taken over completely by emoji, right? Um, and so you can people can use emoticons in many contexts, and they're not considered to be uh, overly emotional or expressive. Uh, they'd be almost like punctuation now. But emoji uh, have more, you know, of a, of a, um, of, a, of a value of um, emotionality, positivity. Um, you know, maybe things that you use informal, as you said. Maybe you use more with your close friends rather than with your boss or your coworkers or whatever. Um, but that changes over time, and 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 these graphicons, as they become older, they become more pragmatically unmarked as they spread and, and become more widespread. I have encountered a few examples of people using emoji in serious contexts. You know, like somebody sent an emoji uh, to their boss. And what we see in Asia, and this is very interesting to me too, is that in Asia, what we see is now stickers are kind of replacing emoji. Yes. And so emoji uh, are now pragmatically unmarked, but the stickers are very pragmatically marked. So the stickers are, are very emotional and very positive, and you, you only send them to people that you're close to. Uh, but even in China, I found one example of somebody who said she sent a sticker to her boss. So which I thought that was pretty surprising, but this is what happens over time. So I would say that that's evidence of pragmatic unmarking. And I'm so glad to hear about it because it, uh, it kind of supports my theory there. Thank you very much. <laughs> so on the, the very last question, <laughs> I think we, we have a Gül. <laughs> You want to thank you so much. Question. And I really want to thank uh, Professor Herring for the amazing talk. And what I want to ask is, uh, you mentioned a set of uh, acts for CMC, CMC acts. Uh, are they a fixed set? And if they are so, um, can we talk about the same set of acts for video mediated communication or split modality? Mm. Uh, or can we maybe talk about uh, different acts or can we add more categories uh, if we're talking about multimodality? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I just applied the CMC Act taxonomy plus the BEHAVE Act to, um, to split modality interactions. And uh, we, we just added an act, we added complement just because it was very frequent in our data. Complements could have been considered claims but we wanted to separate them out because they, they occurred very frequently. Uh, so absolutely different acts can be added, but I always caution, because my students always want to know that question too. It's like, well, can we just add things? And I say yes, um, but you have to be careful when you're adding an act that it's, uh, it's surely meaning-based and not structural-based because people sometimes want to add things like, I'm going to add an act of quote. You know, when somebody's quoting somebody else, well, that's a structural phenomenon. Um, or I'm going to add the act of um, when they use an emoji, you know, no, you can't do that. That's a structural criterion. Um, it has to be meaning based. Um, but I, I've actually been rethinking that taxonomy lately, and I'm a little dissatisfied with some aspects of it. I think I would, I, I want to keep it simple because it's more useful the, the simpler it is, and it's easier to get interrater agreement too. But I think I would break up the inform and the claim acts because those tend to be the most common acts in any data. And um, there's just so many of them that they tend to wash out the other acts. So I think I would probably break out informs and claims. Um, particularly, I might make claims, um, you know, um, I might introduce valence to claims, have them be positive, negative, neutral, um, because it seems like people want to be able to distinguish between positive and negative claims. And, but, I, but depending on your data, I think um, that if one does so cautiously and um, to carefully operationalizing what you mean by the act and that it's not overlapping with other acts because each one should be, should be distinct from the other, then uh, I don't think there's any reason not to add more if that would help explain your data. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Well, this well, has been great fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Susan, again, for this um, very nice and very rich uh, talk. Uh, it was uh, a very interesting conference. Uh, you gave us 
really a lot of, of things to, to think about and, and to talk about. So uh, thank, uh, thank you also uh, to other uh, to students and to, to the to colleagues that join us today. So I think Mariana, we have some uh, before closing and uh, the plenary, I think we have some information for the um, participants, for the students. Well, well we, yeah, we can say it here briefly. So okay. um, there won't be the session by um, Monica, the, the wrap up part now, because she is going to give a quick improvised talk at SIPS, which is a large conference. So Francesca sent you an email. Okay. Um, and so we will see you at 11 for the next plenary. Okay, there will not be uh, that final that thing with Monica between 1010 and 1050. Okay. Just to be sure that you are all informed about that. Maybe someone didn't see the mail or... Okay. okay. So thank you very much again. So uh, see you. It's a plane going. <laughs> I have a question. Um, okay. I have a question. Is Go there on. a way? Is there a way to make uh, my slides available to people if they, if they'd like to see them? Yeah. Thank you so much for saying that. Please no, do. Because yes. I forgot to ask. Please. Thank you. You can you can send it to me. You can send it to me, Susan, and I will forward it. To the, uh, the you, you mean the PowerPoint? I will forward it yeah. to the um, the participants uh, through Claudia Roberta Convey. Excellent. You will, Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure, sure. It, yeah, it's rather large. What I think I'll probably do is I'll put them in Google Drive and I'll give you I'll give you access to it and then you can download it because it's like a huge file. But yeah, right. we'll we'll figure it out. And I'm happy to do that. Thank you Excellent. all very much for your great Thank questions. You Thank I, you. Look, I look forward to reading the chat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See you. All right. Bye. Have a good day. Thank everyone. you again.